We're here with Anthony Oskin! Yay! And it's his birthday. Hi, I'm Anthony Oskin. Welcome to my world. What's this thing here? This is my hot rod, first of all. This is a 1968 Mercury Cougar. It felt like, you know, living in Hollywood, I needed to have a sharp ride. Cougar, just like me! There she is, just like her. This is like my father had one of these cars, and uh, they say as you get older in life, you start going back to your childhood, and here I am. What size engine is that? 302. Whoa. Vroom, vroom! <laughs> like all classic cars, it doesn't start every time. Oopsie. <laughs> but believe me, when this thing goes, it really goes. Everything really kind of started for me with a show called Custom Culture. Was at the Laguna Beach Art Museum in 1993. Back then, if you wanted to be an artist of note, you had to have a hot rod of some kind. And uh, having grown up with a 1967 Cougar, I got 1968 Cougar, so that was my ride back in the day. Robert Williams had a 32 Ford, Piz had a 58 Chevy. Coop had a, I think a 1954, so everybody had some kind of hot rod to drive to show up to the art openings in. How long have you lived here? Since 1998. That's Buddy. Buddy keeps everything under control in, in exchange for food and water, shelter, Meow. and the occasional mouse. Meow. Meow. He's an LA cat. He's jaded. There's the name of your book, L.A. Cat. That's the million seller. <laughs> Let's look at your wonderful office. Here's my studio. It's a converted garage. It's kind of the classic L.A. art studio. Is a, is a garage that's being turned into an art space. So I can still park the car in here if I need to. But this is where it all happens. This is where the inspiration hits me, and this is where the perspiration hits the floor. <laughs> where the inspiration becomes perspiration. Where the inspiration becomes perspiration. Dot com. <laughs> <laughs> it's hashtag. At symbol. Whatever the fuck you, you want, we got it. People are always interested about how I make my paintings, and I'm going to let you know. So you can... You don't have to read it in a big thick book or, or go online or anything like that. I'll explain it to you right now. <laughs> so I basically take a drawing and I do it with a pencil on a, on a piece of paper. I scan it into the computer. Then I use Adobe Photoshop and, and scale things around, move them back and forth, freak them out a little bit with the, with the filters. And then once I have a composition that I like, I project it onto a canvas draw it on with a pencil and then I start painting. So in this, in this one here you can pay, pretty much see I've been working on this for a while so I did like like uh, to me a painting should be constructed the way reality is constructed and that to me is starting in the background and moving forward so I like to paint my backgrounds first then stuff in the foreground to paint on stretch canvas. I like to mix up several different values of the paint so I can do the light value, the middle value, and the dark value. Paste in here, so I like to mix up all my colors, and I keep them in little jars, which I thought was really stupid once, and I laughed at artists who kept like their paint in baby food jars, but now I know why, because it, st it stays good in here, and if I make a mistake, looky here, I got the color I need to fix it. Isn't that great? It's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Ah. <laughs> you know, the horrible thing is sometimes these colors are good enough to eat. <laughs> but you know, you better not eat them. Like, how'd you like some of that? <laughs> I would like to make a line of paint that smelled like the color. Like, this would smell like orange. <laughs> 
tell us about your work. What inspires you to create cats? Well, I feel that ever since the cave paintings in Lascaux, France, that the uh, human figure has been used in art. And so uh, I decided to do away with the human figure in art entirely. And instead I paint cats. Because and cats doing different things and living different lives. Right, cats doing human things, cats doing cat things, cats doing completely crazy non-cat things. I've even seen cat painted cats doing dog things. We don't want to talk about that. Um, basically, my work sort of explores the area between abstract art and figurative art. Um, I, got, I think, feel like the uh, human figure has been used in art since caves, and uh, I think it's about time to change. So I decided instead <coughs> to paint cats. <laughs> and they seem to lend themselves pretty well to being psychedelicized somewhat. Could you show us some of your work? Most of my work is brightly colored. But I also do black and white work like this. One of the elements that I try and, and keep going and consistent in my artwork is uh, sort of the psychedelic nature of the paintings. That's amazing. Who are your favorite artists? Well, I don't have favorite artists, I have favorite artworks. Ah, tell us about that. Well, there's some paintings in the, in the Hermitage. If you ever get to St. Petersburg, Russia, in the Hermitage, there's some incredible 14th, 15th century Flemish paintings. They're just fantastic. In a strange way, I mean, I try and be avant-garde and modern, but at the same time, one of my favorite things is, is old, really old art. Because it was before photography, that's the only record we have, what it was like back then. And I, I think even with the internet and photography, art is the, uh, the best trace of what a culture was like at a certain time. Show us another piece, please. Yeah! <laughs> I also like to, I get tired of painting on paintings on canvases, so frequently I paint on, you know, paint on guitars and things like that. Play us a song, please. I'd love to. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Mr. Wu, what can I do? <laughs> That's about it. We do what we can. Um, one thing I, ha I also do, besides just painting, just painting, is um, I make my own musical instruments. I remember this piece. This is a classic, folks. This is classic. It just got some standing on their seats and rolling in the aisle. The world famous two body guitar. Wow. Jimmy Page. Eat he, your heart out. He did a lot with two necks, but. So this is a uh, stereo guitar. It plays through two amplifiers at once. And depending on which guitar you're playing. It's two separate guitars. Two Did separate guitars, one neck. That's a fact. I play this in the band Cat Museum. And after every show, there's a caravan of ladies following me home. soon at the Punk Film Festival and I am also going to have a retrospective in 2020 at the Fullerton Art Museum. It's going to be a live retrospective so I've been trying to locate 
a life. All my paintings over the course of my life and a life. The most difficult thing about making art isn't making art. It's like, what do you do with it after you've made it? <laughs> and uh, that's a tough question because obviously most people want it to go to a gallery as a place where it's going to be seen by people and maybe even get bought. You know, doing art for art's sake is, I suppose, in some people's repertoire, it's, it's a worthy way of doing things. But I believe in making art for other people and for real purposes, not just for art's sake. So um, that's probably the hardest thing about being an artist is finding a gallery or somebody who will represent you and sell the work. Um, for me, it all started at the Zero. We talked about the Zero One Gallery and that whole crazy scene. Um, and basically, let's skip ahead a few decades, and I have ended up showing at a gallery called the Copro Nason Gallery, which is now the Copro Gallery. At this point, I don't have a gallery. I'm showing at a place called the Garage Gallery because I like to, to show to the kids who come out at night just to, to dance and have a good time. And not necessarily do they go out to look at art, but it's interesting because art becomes part of their night experience. Um, and I really like that, the way that art can be integrated into a person's day as opposed to being something that's yeah, the whole day is, is arranged around, you know. Art should be... There's, there's so many different ways to experience art, but one of them is directly by going to a museum, or another one is indirectly by driving by a, a mural that's done by me or somebody on the street. So uh, that's something that I find really interesting, is that there's so many ways to get your art these days. Uh, once upon a time, it really was just the galleries, and graffiti was just people's names. Uh, it wasn't really like these, these, these great messages and graphic uh, masterpieces that they have now. So that was, that's interesting uh, that art is now like accessible on a daily basis and you don't even know you're driving by art. It's just part of the background, which I think is, is really fascinating. This here is probably the, this is the painting that I'm best known for. It's, uh, it's called Congratulations. It was an album cover for this band, MGMT. Which is a great band, actually. I yeah, like that band, band very much. Really great band. <laughs> I knew this was going to be a 12 inch record cover. I painted it massively huge so that it was reduced, it would look really, really kick ass. And uh, the funny thing was, the original idea was this, this was going to be a lottery ticket. It was, I, the original idea for congratulations was it was supposed to be a lottery ticket with scratch off ink. So they have this, and then if you scratch the ink off underneath, there's this image. A lot of people don't know that. So, when this record came out, the band was pretty hot, and so a lot of money was spent by the record label to make really cool stuff. This is my latest CD cover. I just got this yesterday. This is by some kids called Whale, a band called Whale House up there in, in uh, Wisconsin. Here's some other covers that I've done. These are for a band called The Boredoms. I love that band. Once again, they did they, they, the budget was fairly massive, so they did a really nice, really nice stuff with these things. The cover I did for the band Fuchsia, and they also turned it up and out as a picture disc. Which is funny because, you know, when I was a kid growing up in Houston, Texas, I never thought that one day I'd do album covers. 
It just seemed incredible. If you had told me what I would be doing in Los Angeles all those years later. I find it really amazing that art has gotten to the point where it's something that's included in the planning of, of big music festivals like Coachella uh, or even Life is Beautiful in Las Vegas. There, once upon a time, kids, all that you would get when you went to a music festival was music. <laughs> and that was okay because that's all people expected. But now the bar is being raised, or should I say the easel has been raised. <laughs> The paintbrush has been raised to bring art into these kind of environments where people can look at them when they're going from one stage to another or when there's a band on stage that they don't like or they just want to chill out. It's really great that there's places within a music festival that people can go and have an art experience. So where were you born and what made you get into art? <laughs> I was born in Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean to a Welsh father and a Dutch mother. My father was a brilliant man and he was sent from Texaco, from Trinidad to Houston to start an early computer uh, science department for Texaco in 1960. Um, I put up with Houston, Texas as long as I could and when I was 18 I left and came to, went to Austin, lived there for a year and then I came to LA. And uh, that was in 1980, that's where I met Tequila. And that's really, uh, I'd like to say that's where my life began. You know, everything was preparatory up to that point. I got to meet the writers I'd always wanted to meet, and artists, and active artists. And this place was just phenomenal to me. I'd never, I couldn't believe that a place like this was real, where you could walk down the street and you could see William Burroughs or... Um, Lee Roth. TLR, yeah, exactly, <laughs> that these people existed. I swear to God I saw Michael Jackson walking down the street, but I don't know if that's true. He had a halo. <laughs> the saintly man. <laughs> yes, that's what they all say. <laughs> so what is your next project? Your next big project is 2020 at the Fullerton. Fullerton Art Museum. That's a right, big life retrospective. That's, good. that's a big deal. I'm looking forward to that. Um, most of my shows now are out of town because I've been in LA for so long that I'm no longer the, the hot new flavor. Um, and the street art has basically kind of taken over uh, the art scene. So uh, I like to show out of town. You know, in LA, you have an art opening and people will are standing and it looks, it seems as though they're looking at the painting, but if you walk up there and you listen to what they're saying, they're talking about where they're gonna have dinner. They're not talking about the painting. <laughs> so it's kind of nice to, uh, go to a smaller town where people really get into the art. And it's not just the smaller towns either. Um, I've shown in Milan, Italy, and, and the Italians really enjoy their art and, and go up there and listen if you can understand Italian. In 2011, I was asked to do the uh, Christmas windows for a department store in Milan called La Rina Sente. So I designed it, these characters, my usual crazy, weird, kinetic cats, and uh, they actually built some sculptures of them uh, in uh, Turin, handmade these eight foot tall sculptures. And that was a really fascinating thing because seeing my characters actually go from two dimensions on the painting to three dimensional sculptures was a really great experience. Uh, not only that, but the, the interaction between the people and the sculptures was really interesting. I really liked affecting people in a, in a sort of public way like that. You know, they didn't have to go into a gallery. It was, I could talk, you know, they could experience art just by walking by their favorite department store. So obviously when Christmas was over, the sculptures had to go. <laughs> but uh, not so fast. So in 2018, I was asked by a design group in Italy to uh, include my sculptures in a design show that was going on in Seoul, South Korea. Uh, we located the sculptures at the mall in Hong Kong, but they hadn't been taken care of, and they uh, declined somewhat in condition. So a quick uh, meeting was called, and it was decided to make them again. Uh, what I found interesting was that in 2011, it was cost effective to have these sculptures built by hand, but in 2017, 2018, 
it was much better to use a 3D program. So instead of these sculptures being carved out of foam by a person in Italy, they were basically 3D printed in pieces and then later assembled and sent off to the show. So it was pretty interesting to see the difference between the handmade ones and the uh, 3D printer generated ones. Um, and I have to say that as perfect as those 3D generated ones were, I did actually like the, the hand sculpted ones better. Also, uh, I, I like showing in different towns. I, I just came back from a show that I had in Santa Fe. Uh, that town is so full of artists. It's just amazing. And it was really nice that the gallery there had decided to try and show more urban uh, cosmopolitan art the, instead of just the uh, howling coyotes and, you know, turquoise and orange, uh, you know, uh, bolo ties and stuff like that. So I really enjoy showing out of L.A. in different cities. And that's, that's uh, it's almost like, um, it's like you got to have the missionary zeal like, like, like the priests do, you know, let's bring God to the natives. It's like, let's bring Alice Gang's art to the natives. <laughs> so that's what, we're, that's what it's all about. I really like that interaction too because uh, people just aren't jaded when you go to, to, to smaller towns or, and get out of L.A. So that's, that's really a rewarding experience. This is a painting from... 1991, and so since I'm getting ready for the retrospective, I have to try and locate as many of my old paintings as possible. And uh, this particular painting uh, ended up with these people who kept it in the apartment they rented. So for years, this this painting was in an apartment, and. Uh, Which I find really cool because that means a lot of different people lived with it over the years. Once upon a time, this was the, the, the newest painting I've done, which I showed at the Zero One Gallery initially. Mm -hmm. uh, that's where I got my start, is at the Zero One Gallery when it was located on. I was a curator there. Lafrey and Melrose, and she was a curator there. She kept it going on. Because the guy who ran the place could not. As much as we loved him, right? Did you say love? Well, Arboro? <laughs> what a beautiful piece of art that is. Yeah, it's interesting to, to, uh, to see it again after all these years. That was really surprising. How did you get it? I thought I had to put the word out that I was looking for my paintings, the older art was, and uh, somebody said, oh yeah, there's that painting that was in that apartment, and so I managed to find this one. But there's a few that I haven't been able to find, and some of the best, some of my best paintings. Are you borrowing I that? Or? Vanished. Yeah, I, I actually, they were, this painting was, was going to end up even more fucked up than it is, so I decided, I told him that even though the, the show isn't for a year, I would, I would store it at my studio because they were just going to make, they were taking care of it. Most people don't, don't know how to take care of art. Once it's off the wall, they just, things get messed up. That was one of the problems with the Zero One, is that uh, paintings tended to get damaged there. When they were In the bathroom when everybody was drinking beer? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the Zero was an amazing place. It was an underground art gallery that started in the early 80s, like 1980, actually. Right. Next door to Cash, which was a fantastic place. And that was also an art gallery run by... Janet Cunningham. Who's recently deceased. The late Janet Cunningham. Who is now part of the UCLA archives. I set that up, and it's fabulous. Oh, that's great. I didn't know that. You have to keep in mind that at that time, in the early 80s, there weren't that many galleries showing not the kind, this kind of art. In fact, there were only two places at all, really. One of them was the Zero One of Cash, and then later La Luz de Jesus. What kind of art is this? You call it lowbrow. Back then, it was called custom culture because people were doing painting, putting hot rods in their paintings. And really, I think, 
the most, uh, that was the art movement that's getting the most attention because of an artist by the name of Robert Williams, who became the patron sort of the state <laughs> of the lowbrow art scene in Los Angeles. He has a uh, Juxtapose magazine. He later was founded Juxtapose magazine that was a, a chronicle of, the, of this art scene that we're talking about. I used to book you guys at Zomo, the Zone Mockingbird Gallery. Zomo? Yeah. Ray yeah. Zone and I when we were dating. <laughs> I didn't know you dated Ray. Oh, yes. The late Ray. How would you get a show in Albuquerque or somewhere else? In well, when I first started out, I had to, I, we had something called slides. There were 35 millimeter actual pieces of film that were put in cardboard holders. And uh, that was the standard way of presenting your artwork to a gallery. So being a little nobody, uh, like I had my sheet of slides and I would take them to art galleries. And uh, I went to the East Village in New York, went to all the different galleries, my sheet of slides to show them off. And nothing happened, in fact. Would the people be receptive to that or? Everybody was receptive, but only to a point because once I once they realized I was from Los Angeles, and they, you know, like, we don't give a fuck. I mean, there's billions of artists living in New York that can bring their artwork on the subway. They don't need to have the work shipped across country. So once I realized that I wasn't going to get in any galleries in New York, I started hiking around LA, and uh, that's where I met Janet Cunningham at Cash. Agent, she was a casting agent for punk rocks in Los Angeles, so. She, she had this big space and she needed art on the walls and so she would have art shows and introduce her clients to the various punks and things like that. Uh, like Tequila said earlier, she was located next door to a place called the Zero One, which was pretty much... The first happening art gallery for our generation. Yeah, in Los Angeles, totally. But um, it was sort of a club in the beginning, wasn't it? Yeah, that was the whole thing, was it was an after-hours club that John could get around the uh, liquor laws by saying it was a private party. And look, I mean, there, there's art on the walls and blah, blah, blah. So, oh, you could drink for five bucks. Yeah, and being an art show, it was basically by invitation only. So it wasn't public. So John managed to pull that off. All right, thank you. We're here with Anthony Oskang in the lair of Mr. Oskang. Yeah. Happy birthday! <laughs> One more time. <laughs> Happy birthday! Yes! <laughs> this is such a California scene. I love it. I know, huh? See you later. <laughs>